Chats, episode 52. I see, oh, you got a nice bottle of water. I've got a, I've got a beer right off, Al. Okay. Uh, I'll try to say, you can tell the athlete between me and you, mate. Mr. Josh Turnbull, nice to have you on, pal. What's going on? Uh, mate, it's, I've been meaning to come on for so long. It's, gl- it's finally here. And I'm glad to get on there and uh, get on Cat Flap Chats. Hey, look, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I know... Uh, you're a busy man at the moment, obviously in the middle of this, well, yeah, middle of the season now, played at the weekends, we're just saying off pod then, good uh, good result for Cardiff, good to get a win, been playing some decent stuff, defence has been classed this season, but not always picked up the, the points, so good to get that on the weekend. Oh, you know, I, I think especially after the last three weeks where we've, you know, it's gone, it's been pretty tough and we've had a couple of open, frank discussions and meetings and, uh, yeah. you know, cleared up, it, had a bit of clarity and then, you know, uh, all week it was pretty nice weather <laughs> leading into the game. And we think, you know, it's past seven. You know, let Jared run the run the show, and then all of a sudden it buckets down and <laughs> we got bath. So, uh, but it's nice to get that W and uh, you know finally uh, start. Well, you know, it's nice to be sitting in second in the table. So, you know, which is which is uh, a little bit different to where we were last year. How are things at the Blues on this year? Obviously, it's been a bit of a mental year in terms of what's going on and. Ending the season and then starting into the new one, Rodney Parade and everything else that's kind of been thrown at you. How is it? How is it down there? I think it's, I think it's been tough with uh, with COVID, uh, especially moving training venues as well. Obviously, yeah. um, you know the last couple of years we've been down in um, we've been down in um, the Vale. Vale. Yeah, we moved from the Vale to the Arms Park, and then you know we were crammed in the Arms Park, and now we found somewhere that's. Um, it's decent, and we, the boys all really like getting pen twin. So yeah, you know, it's um, you know it's actually really good. Looks like decent facility down there. Yeah, you know, it's, there's plenty of space there for us, and uh, you know, I think the boys are really enjoying being in a in a large large area and um, big big spaces for us to work. Um, yeah, and you know, it's, it's it's what you want as a high performance uh, team. Yeah, um, you know, it's uh, I think. You know, the, the, obviously, with the the hospital going to the Arms Park as well in the stadium, uh, you know, you know, we, we want to help those kind of situations as well, and uh, you know, for the for the Cardiff Blues to be um, uh, helpful to the NHS, you know, it, it just shows yeah you know, where we are as a, as a group really. No, it's brilliant. It's, those like frank conversations you've had, and I know obviously what some of the boys are like. Do you lead them, or is that led by the coaches? Like, I know you can't say too much about what gets said, but is that where you know Ellis has come back now, which is a positive, and he's training, and apparently he's said a few things as well. Yeah, I think you know you, you kind of you rely on your the senior players, especially um, you know because at the end of the day, they're the ones out there who are going to feel it, and you know they're going to. Basically, they're the ones who are going to be doing it. So, you know, it, um, I think sometimes it's, you know, the coaches will have good discussions with players about what they want, and then you know the co- the players will feed back, and you know that's how you kind of um, get to where you are really, and in, in terms of the game plan. And you know, I just think there was probably uh, too many players off script, um, and that's what we wanted to clear up the last couple of couple of couple of weeks. And you know, for someone like Ellis, who's got uh, you know, he's club captain and, you know, he's got bags of experience yeah. um, come in and, you know, he's obviously starting to come into some meetings now because he's he's prepping to get back into rugby and which is, you know, being out for two years now is a long old shift and, you know, to see what he's gone through, um, you know, weekly, monthly, you know, it's, it's been tough for him. But, you know, I think there's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel now and, um, you know, to have someone of uh, his experience in that room uh, speaking up, then um, it's good. Yeah, fair play to the boy. Two years, that's some resilience. I remember watching it on TV and it's, like, was it last ruck of the game or whatever? Like, I've spoke to him quite a bit and he's never been down about it. He's always just been like, there's another goal, there's another goal, we'll get there, we'll keep working. Like, fair play to him. I think, I think uh, you know, it's te- like, I've been injured uh, enough times long term injuries as well uh, but you know it's a, it's a test of character mentally and physically and you know you're always going to have down days um, and I'm sure Ellis would have had them but you know he's had great support um, around him his family so um, you know the medical staff of the Blues his, all his mates you know they only want him to, to get better and get back on the field because yeah. we know how much of a quality player 
Ellis is, and you know, I'm sure he'll 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 be back within no time now, and you know, hopefully we'll see him on the pitch doing what he did best and uh, and carving up again. I hope so, mate. He's a nice kid as well. Do you um, do you feel extra pressure then? As one of the I suppose more senior players, one of your 250 plus prem uh, or regional games, like, do you feel that pressure to say something or deliver above and beyond? You know your normal good performance. I think um, it's probably kind of changed um, in the last couple of years, especially like now. Um, there's more and more of these younger boys are stepping up, and they're they're being more vocal because you know, look, there's there's guys like Garen Smith who's twenty something years old, early twenties, and he's got a hundred appearances already. Yeah, Garen's not far off. Thomas and far off, and these guys lately hit fifty on a weekend. These guys are starting to speak up now because they have got that experience. And sometimes, you know, um, I'll kind of get just going to speak to some of the, the, the younger boys, the academy boys, and make sure they're happy and yeah. make sure they're, they understand everything. Because that's probably the, the bit, the, that transitional period where you're probably breaking out from academy into that senior team and you're like learning all the new structures and the plays and the physicality of things and how our senior team does things. And that's where I'll probably lend a hand to some of those younger players. And many of them want to chat. Doors always open. Like, Dylan started calling me the granddad of the group. Like, <laughs> oh, arses, arses, guys. He is, he's the white hair, mate. That's what it is. <laughs> it's, it's white, not grey. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> platinum. Platinum lid. Platinum lid. He looks like uh, a granddad when he's got his tash going as well. <laughs> Let's make a dirty old man. Oh. So yeah, no, it's it's um, it's uh, but you know there is sometimes a time where you just have to speak up and say, look, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and this is how we're going to go about it. And uh, you know, I think, uh, but like I said, the more younger boys who are stepping up now with that experience, the better, really. Yeah, definitely. How do you find? You mentioned there about like big injuries, and obviously Ellis hopefully be back soon. How do you deal with things like that personally? Because it's. It's, everyone always sees the highs, but no one ever sees the lows. They might see you get injured, but then they don't see the rehab for the next three, six, nine, twelve months or whatever, and those dark days. How do you deal with it? Um, it was pretty well. I've had, I've had a couple of nasty ones. I had I had uh, a shoulder done, and then I had both my shoulders done at the same time. Um, and then I, excuse me, I had uh, a half my disc out of my lower back end because I'd ruptured it. Yeah. So I was oh. out for about nine months with that one. Yeah. Um, and I'd had a bit of an issue with it before. And then once it, it went, it went. And, you know, for the first eight weeks, literally, I couldn't stand up for longer than 10 minutes. I couldn't couldn't walk and stand up straight and um, pretty much bedridden for those first few weeks. Like, and yeah. um, I didn't think at the time there was <laughs> any light at the end of the tunnel. And then, um, obviously, you start doing your rehab and your your focus changes a little bit. And after that eight weeks, of, like, you know, I kind of got over that little hurt, that, well, that big hurdle, uh, the yeah. first hurdle. And then, you know, it was just a case of just getting on with it. And, you know, it was a long, long old road. And I probably wouldn't, would have been fit to play the end of that season around the April, May time. But um, talking to physios, it's like, like, why rush it for two games when, you know, you can give yourself an extra couple of months with, with the pre-season and, and yeah. come back getting ready for the following year. And, um, I had a few of the boys going, oh, don't worry, you had la- all the last year off. I'm like, three <laughs> games out of 30 the following year. <laughs> Walking around like a cripple again. Yeah, it's tough, um, man. You'd be on the Zimmer frame. <laughs> but like that sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just, but I kind of thrive on um, getting to the end of the season and, um, or at the beginning of the season, I'm saying, look, I'm going to be um, number one minutes played the region yeah. or you know that that's like my type of goal you know I just want to be you know I know I'm durable enough I've played enough rugby now and yeah. they're kind of like little targets that I've got to set myself and you know I would have been if I hadn't had a red card this year <laughs> <laughs> that was his mates I mean that was controversial I think the the out the uh Twitter afterwards like whether it was a red or not like personally I understand the shoulder to the head I I understand the law and the rule to protect the player who's attacking or defended, whichever way it goes. But in the, in like in the spirit of the game, you're, you're like that's not a fucking red, surely. Like yeah. to me, it's got to, like, that's a yellow. But 
I do understand the, the process. I think it'd be nice if they went yellow, but they put you on report and then they have a look at afterwards and then yeah, then, because from my from my point of view, there's like no malice in it. It's just no. um, I probably haven't dipped low enough, and you know he's adjusted real late. So yeah, you know, he, he, the game is moving so fast these days that you don't get that opportunity to um, like readjust. And it's yeah. like I think there's been four, five, maybe six red cards since my one in the first uh, week of the season. The All Blacks game the other day with Australia, there was two in that game, weren't there? Well, I, I was just on about Pro 14, right? There was, and there's another two there. So yeah. yeah. And then, funny enough, I rang, I rang uh, Nigel Owens up <laughs> after it happened on the, on like um, the Monday or Tuesday. I was like, oh, look, what's your thoughts on this? And uh, when I tried ringing him the first time, he said, oh, look, I'll call you back. I'm in a meeting. And then uh, he rang me back later on, about half a six, he said, you can time your phone calls, mind. I was sitting in a Pro 14 referees meeting. And we're talking about your red card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's brilliant, Alice. Right? Um, and he said, look, we've all kind of look, said, look, it's a, it's a real soft red card. And like, yeah. you, go, you go three, four inches lower and, you know, you're not talking about it. But, you know, um, it's, it's the way the game's going. I, I, like, I watched a game of rugby league the day afterwards. Rab goes with someone, and there's about 300 hits like that. Every <laughs> yeah, they're just melting, that. melting boys across the top, top of their chest, shoulder, and jaw, aren't they? Oh, uh, it's like it's, it's, well, it's a completely different game now, isn't it? And, yeah, uh, it's, I know the safety. There's a big safety aspect of the game now, and uh, yeah. I think they're just looking after the the, the the carrier, the attacker, and the defender. So yeah, uh, get the eradicate out of the game, basically. Yeah, I, I do get it. I think, I suppose, you know, when I played, if someone had done that to me, I'd probably be out cold anyway. But I don't remember ever really kicking off too much about it. But then I never suffered with concussions. Or well, I didn't make a tackle for one, so it was fucking easy. <laughs> I was ruck inspecting, mate, and they'd give me the ball to play. That's how I play. Honestly, I'm the sort of player who would, like, cross field 22 in his own half to give it to the winger to score, like... I wouldn't fucking tackle people. Oh, players, like. Not at all like that. Go on, run down here. <laughs> oh, revolving door, like. Yeah, yeah exactly. Turnstile. Yeah. Now, I do understand it is tough. It's, it's, I suppose it's frustrating for you because you have been playing well this year as well. You have been putting in some decent performances. I think, I think uh, they say things come in three. So I had a bit of... Um, I trained the house down in lockdown. I was like yeah. literally... Like, Flying in the test, I, was, I felt real strong. I got over the gym in the garage and uh, I'd had a really good uh, off season. I went real hard for the first couple of weeks thinking, oh, you know, three, four weeks now we'll be back in and end up in for three, four months. And you know, <laughs> I was a decent nick going back in. Yeah. And, uh, and then um, literally the week of the Scarlet's game, I kind of had a bit of a twinge in my back and then my calf was tight and leading into the game. Played like a bag of shit. Got yellow carded after 45 minutes and didn't go back on. And I was captain <laughs> as well. <laughs> so I was like, all oh, right, okay. The following week against the Ospreys, I'd been like sacked off. Wasn't even meant to play. Dropped. Uh, and it was only by default. So I ended up getting injured in, in training. And I got called up. So I was like, oh, yeah, playing out. Literally played 50 minutes. I can feel my calf going again. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. Better tell him. Came off. Um... And then, was it two weeks later, we played uh, Zebra, went out yeah. there and literally, obviously thought I put a good shot, but actually melted his bumps off and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, had a red card. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that's three weeks of shit. Then. So <laughs> I had another three weeks of, of downtime um, and then come back. And since then, touch wood, everything's been flying. You've been, you've been all right, mate. It's, uh, it's interesting how different people, like, deal with those situations like I hated playing rugby in the winter which I don't know why I bother playing it but for me like those cold and wet minging days where you know it's just going to be 10 man rugby yeah. I can't stand that for a bigger lad I much prefer the sun hard ground and playing you were saying like off off pod like that's where you come into your own you absolutely love that minging conditions like where does that come from because not normal people don't like that <laughs> they don't like. I don't care what anyone says. Down, down in Newcastle, in, in, when I was a, when I was a kid growing up, playing in the bog, and uh, literally <laughs> the, there's a river that runs around the pitch, so it flood, flood, used to flood every year. 
the pitch would be <laughs> flooded and you'd be like, this is awesome. So you just go around melting people and you'd enjoy it. So, you know, um, that's probably where that's come from. And then, you know, as you grow up, you play, you play on artificial services and you know that you can play like a faster game and, yeah. you know, it's, um, and more ex- open, expansive, which is, you know, which has really suited the Blues and the players they've got in the last couple of years, really. So, yeah. you know, I think, you know, I feel comfortable playing both. I enjoy playing both because, you know, when it's wet and boggy, you're probably going to defend a little bit more and you're going to put a little bit more, sh- few more big shots in and yeah. you know, the little speed of balls is going to be slower. And, and then when you come to the, the, the open running rugby in the, in the summer, like you, like you say, you know, you can play a bit more expansive and get your ball in hand and, the Lale rugby. Uh, there's you, eh, mate? That's why I like. There's you, eh? Get the calf lap going. What was uh, what was rugby like for you growing up there? What was growing up like? You know, did you play any other sports? Was it just rugby? Uh, oh, dual international. I had. Uh, I I was a schoolboy champion at javelin. Um, oh yeah. So I did quite a bit of athletics growing up, um, and then probably got to about sixteen and had to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, have to come. Both of my parents are English, non-rugby background. Uh, yeah. My mum moved down from uh, Durham when she was about 18. Okay. Uh, met my dad down here. And uh, so they both moved down to Wales. Um, and uh, yeah, basically born and bred in Wales, West Wales. Um, West is there. chest. West is chest, as they say. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was always fun and games. Um, Obviously, coming from a non-rugby background, parents really didn't really understand the game. Yeah, but I knew from a young age that that's why I enjoyed doing. Um, yeah, that was always fun and game because, like, uh, <laughs> Sunday morning, six o'clock in the morning, you'd have to, or seven o'clock in the morning, you'd have to go meet the boys in the Kamal, then to go wherever. And I remember, <laughs> I remember this one time where I said to the old man, "Like the garage shut six o'clock on a on a Saturday night. Make sure you got some fuel in the car ready for tomorrow because you have got to go to Kamal." <laughs> yeah, like, call about six or even. And I remember, I remember we jumped in the car and we literally, garage was shut in the morning. We'd gone the night, the garage was shut. It shut early for some reason. Next morning, garage was still shut. So he's like, right, we'll back ourselves to get there. And uh, <laughs> we'll, free, we'll free wheel down the hills and stuff. So I remember this now. And we literally, we've started to stutter now and we're not even halfway there. And we go around <laughs> the next corner and there's some council workers on the road. And it must be like half six, seven o'clock now. There's some yeah. council workers on the road and they've got a massive drum of red. And he's gone up to them and said, look, can I, can I, I need some diesel to get to, get to come out of them. And they're like, yeah, take that five, five litre drum over there. And he filled up the car and he got me there, to be fair. And nice. he's like, they're like, that was, that was just one of a few times. And, you know, was, <laughs> I haven't come from a rugby background, I, no, but I used to love, I just loved it from when I first touched the ball. And, yeah. Uh, uh, to be fair, my parents would do anything to get me there on a Saturday, Sunday, wherever I needed to be. Um, meet the boys in command at the lift share, whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was it was an experience, I'd say. I love that. Is it Hartford West? Well, I'm Newcastle Emlyn. Oh, OK. I was going to say, I've been to Eddie's yeah, Rocks before. Hartford West, then brought up in Newcastle Emlyn. It was probably okay. about half hour, 40 minutes from H West. Yeah, I've been... I, it's on the big hill, isn't it? As you're sort of going through West Wales. I, I yeah. can't remember... I think I've been down there and played played down that way before. I've been to Halford West, mate. I went to Eddie's Rocks once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, an ex missus used to live in Narbeth, and we went out in Halford West once. So I'm in there. This guy like slaps me from behind, and I'm like, "Fuck, who's this?" Like, my missus is tiny. I'm not hard. It's Sparky, the analyst. <laughs> like, yeah, what? So like, what are you doing here? I think his ex missus used to live down that way as well. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Funny, like, it's an uh, interesting place, mate. Have a West. Yeah, interesting. It's, uh, I, I remember going on a night out there, and uh, we'd, uh, we'd started off in Newcastle Emlyn, all black shirts, pink ties. There's about <laughs> 18 of us, all dressed the same. We must have been like 17, 18. Yeah, blazing squad. Pubs on the way there, and every pub we stopped at, we thought we'd take like something, an ornament from the, <laughs> from the places. Yeah. But we stopped in one and they had this big uh, big picture of Graham Henry and all uh, all the Welsh team and they yeah. must have been on top of the Brecon Beacons or something and it's all signs. So one of the boys managed to like get that in the back of the uh, minibus and then there was like a door wedge, a sheep. There was a door wedge. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped in the harbour, someone took the pub's telephone 
like portable telephone. <laughs> you know. get, the, get the H West, and we're sitting there. It's like uh, minibus drivers come looking for all the boys. It's like yeah. we've got to go. Police have told us we've got to go and take everything back. So oh. uh, I don't turn the other way back. <laughs> <You know. laughs> the door stops. Jesus Christ. That's what I was saying. If, if any police listen to this, me fucking tapping you up otherwise. Yeah, oh, no. That well, was a long time ago. It's nearly. <laughs> Class. 12 years hey, ago. I'm sure that's not the worst thing you ever got up to, mate. Nah, it's kind of Definitely not. So, what was. Because. Am I right to say that you played growing up with Scott Williams and Gareth Davis as well? So, I was the same age as Gareth's brother. Yeah, uh, my brother's the same age as Scott and Gareth, so okay. we were in the same club. Yeah, uh, along with Gareth Thomas, who's at uh, the prop of the Ospreys. Yeah, my cousin Steph and Thomas, who's prop of the Scarlets. Yeah, so we've all come from the same club, but uh, I was probably I was two years older then, maybe. Okay, so I was the first, probably the first one from the club to come through, and then there was a conveyor belt of just three, four, yeah, people yeah. all come through. Um, and to be fair, Scott and Gareth have really pushed on. Uh, you know, I know Scott's had a similar injury to what I had and he struggled the last 12, 18 months with it. Yeah. Um, but again, to see those two boys, where they come from, you know, I remember Scott and Gar running around his little nippers and they'd wind everyone up down the local club. Like, literally, <laughs> they, would, they would rip it into anyone. So, uh, you know, to be fair, both of them got on um, to achieve good things and, uh, yeah, they, they're doing well. What was that coming up like coming through? Did you come through the academy at the Scarlets or were you... Yeah, so you so played I, in Prem as well, didn't you? Yeah, I was a little bit of a... Um, I never... Like, I was 16, and I was, uh, I was... I played... Hang on, what have I done? I played Wales 16's A's. Uh, yeah. Not big, it was like uh, about five of the boys from the Scarlet region had got in, and uh, I think I was like... Or, yeah, one of the only boys not to have been capped then. So yeah. I was like, oh, look, you know, I'm going to make it a target to get capped the following year. And uh, the following year then, 18s... I was out of those five. I was the only one. So okay. I was like, that was a bit of a that was a bit of a turnaround then. Yeah. Um, and I just went from there. And then I remember turning up. I'd gone out. We'd done this two day Scarlet trial for Scarlet A teams. And the first day, you know, it was just skills and stuff. Second day was a game. But after the Saturday, I'd gone out uh, with my mates. Gone to a bit of a sesh. Didn't get home <laughs> till about two in the morning. Yeah. I was probably still drunk when I played this uh, trial game the next day. <laughs> And I just ripped it up. <laughs> no care in the world. I, I, I didn't feel a thing. And um, again, uh, like on the Monday then, the following Monday, uh, the academy manager, Kev George, rang my old man and said, oh, look, we want to take him to North Wales on an academy trial. We've, we've been impressed with what we've seen. And like, they'd already picked four boys my age. Uh, John Fox was one of them, Lloyd Phillips, Darren Allison, uh, yeah. boys Morgan. And obviously boys like Ken and Dom, Rob McCusker, um, Reese Priest and Rory already in there by then. Yeah. So, um, I like had uh, some team in it, that, that's some academy team. Yeah, it wasn't too bad actually. A lot of us went on to play with Fletcher together. Yeah. And, uh, that, obviously, people like Darren Daniels, Liam Davis were all in there as well. Um, we went up to North Wales and uh, they said, Oh, what's your X factor then? What are you good at? And I'm like, Do a bit of athletics, so I can run a decent 3K time. <laughs> and I ran like this 3K in like 950 something. I blitzed, I blitzed it. <laughs> I was like, ah. I did it in my West Wales Athletics Fest. It was fast. <laughs> <laughs> that is fast. That is fucking uh, fast. And uh, that's, they just said, like, fair play, you've got a decent engine, we can build something on that. Yeah. So, you know, a bit ripe to the skills, probably need to put a little bit of weight on, and uh, to be fair, mm. Alan Walters, who was the Academy s &C, now with uh, Leicester. Done yeah. Obviously, World Cup winning now and he with South Africa, but he yeah. literally transformed me um, in a couple of years. Um, he'd drive down to Newcastle Edmund from Clarty, you know, that's an hour's drive, spend a Tuesday or Thursday afternoon with me in the gym. Um, you know, and then we had Rob Apps as our skills coach, and to be fair, he worked hard with me as well. So I kind of came through that academy system, academy system and I was there for maybe two or three years. And by that point, I was, you know, knocking on the door. But what was good was a lot of us came through together. Uh, yeah. Like some of the names I mentioned, we all went on to play for Snaffy together, and we had some real good times. Uh, and then some of us went off. I went to play for Sandovery and also played for Commander the Quins as well. So yeah, you know, it's just I think those those first two years when I was at Snaffy were really, you know 
it was like favorite it was like this is what pro rugby is about because uh, you know a lot of us were training with the seniors and then playing playing for this the Fnatic team on the Saturday and yeah. you know it kicked on our development really and you know there were some good socials afterwards as well. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine back when phones were probably a bit less prevalent and uh, you could just sit in a dark corner and lock it in. <laughs> yeah, I miss I miss them days really. Yeah. What was um. Well, how did you find that transition then? Because obviously you weren't quite as much of a lump as you are now. How did you find that play stepping into senior rugby in a professional environment rather than like the majority of people listening to this would probably have played club rugby. If they're lucky, they might have played Division One Championship, Premiership or whatever. How did you find that just going straight into it from sort of a school level? Uh, well, my first year of pro rugby or men's rugby was spent on the physio bed. <laughs> 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 Literally, yeah, it was, it was like one thing after another. So I was still eligible for twenties, and I'd, I'd already done two. Uh, I'd done two nineteens World Cups. I'd gone to Dubai, yeah. and I'd done one in Ireland. And then they changed it the following year to twenties. So I was still eligible for twenties. And I was, I'd like I played a, a, um, a friendly for the Scarlet, so I'd made my debut for them already. And yeah, um, I was literally um, a member my my second year of nineteens. Alec Walters had taken me out of rugby for eight weeks, slammed a load of weight on me because they were like trying to prep me for men's rugby. Yeah. And uh, literally, I remember uh, going to train up in Whitchurch at the school there for Wales yeah. 19. And I was driving up there and I was like, my, my belly's so bad. My be like, and I've just, like, I haven't played rugby for eight weeks. I, I, I've done a bit of training, but I've just literally been sitting in the gym. I thought, oh my God, so bad. And drove up there. I felt like I needed a toilet so bad all the way through the session. We were there all day. Literally, on driving home, I was like, keeled over in the back, lying on the back. She's like, oh my God, boys, I don't know what's wrong with me. Got home, went to bed, tried to sleep it off. Next day, woke up, like, crawling down the stairs. <laughs> um, I've gone, like, to Reese, uh, Reese Owen Williams. He's, he plays rugby league for Wales, he does. Yeah. He looks like Mo Farah. Yeah, 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 I know. And I looked at him for a bit and I said, mate, i got to go to the doctor. And he's like, he's looking at me. He's like, grim as anything as well. He's like, I'll come with you. So he went to, went up this surgery and we had to register. So I'm like, keeled over trying to fill the forms in. <laughs> and the doctor sees me. She's like, oh, I want to take a urine sample. So I'm like, okay, give her, give her a urine sample. She goes, oh, I want you to take us up to the hospital in Snaffy to get it double checked. So I drive up there uh, and I'm like, literally, again, I'm driving up there. I don't know how I'm driving up there. Um, I'm keeled over. I'm literally passing out in the uh, in the waiting room, and they call me in to the old and uh, check me over. They said <laughs> going in for surgery now. I'm like surgery for what? And like your appendix is coming out. And I'm like Jesus. What? So I literally stacked on about five six kilos in those eight weeks, and went to shit. I was like Jesus. ragged over there. And I was like. Uh, I was out of rugby for 14 weeks or something, literally put a curveball in me. Uh, so that was the that was out for then. Started to come back, played a game, dink on my AC joint. I was out for another six weeks. Fucking hell, mate. That, like, for just one game. Yeah. Uh, I ended up being lucky enough to play. That, that one game I dinked my shoulder, I was playing for Newcastle Lemon. It's the only ever game I played for Newcastle Lemon first. I think it was a yeah. tumble or something. <laughs> <laughs> Picked on the top of a school hill or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my shoulder. I was like, oh, here's another six weeks down the Swanee. Um, yeah. Lit, come back and ended up captain in Wales 19s. And then went to the World Cup 20s the following year. Uh, was when we had the big bust up with the French team in the. Yeah, yeah. What started that? Because that 20s team was wouldn't be far off if you put it on paper now. Wouldn't be far off like a Wales team that you'd see now. Yeah. To be fair, there was. That my first year nineteens and that that second my my first year twenties were both very good teams and like if I went through the first one where you had like uh, Hugo Staffs and Ken Owens Jamie Corsi yeah uh, Lou Reed Brad Davis myself Lewis Evans Dan Franks Robert Lewis or Darren Allison Priestland Rob, uh, uh, Jones was his name uh, Reese Jones John Fox Gareth Maul Alec Jenkins. Uh, Martin Thomas, I'm trying to think who the other winger was. Uh, That's class. Rob, That's Rob, Rob Lewis's brother, James Lewis. So, you know, oh, that, yeah. all those boys all went on to play regional rugby. Yeah. Um, and like you're thinking, like James Downs was in that squad as well, played at 200 games for Cardiff and the Blues. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Glenn Flower was in around that squad then up before he went to play league. Um, Breezy, Mark Breeze. Yeah. So, I think that squad was like Sam Kiley's another one, played for the Ospreys. That's a fucking so, good old squad, isn't it? Yeah, and then they all went off to play 20s. And then two years later, the following year, it was like Bevington, Sam Hobbs, uh, Reese Lawrence, uh, Hayden Pugh, Ashley Sweet, Jaron Groves, myself, yeah. Orby, Dan Franks, Tips, Lloyd Phillips, Nick Cudd. Uh, that's just, well, you know, um, Scott Andrews, Bubba. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, Reese Webb, Gareth Williams, Dan Bigger, Gareth Owen, Foxy again, um, Luke Ford. Ford, oh, yeah, Ford and Fordy. Dan Evans and uh, Pence. Yeah. So, like, obviously, looking at that squad, going, most of those boys have gone on to become internationals. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's rare that you'd see a team like that. Like, you would never see an England 20s team with, you know, you could pick, what, 15 to 20 internationals or being in squads, or yeah. more than that have been regional players. You wouldn't get an England 20s team that looked like that 10 years later. Uh, no, I think I think a lot of it is obviously, you know, in England, they get boys and they come, they probably come through a little bit later than what than what we would. And then obviously the academy is structured a little bit different here. So, you know, they put that effort, that time and effort into you. And, you know, I think we really had a real good feeling that 20s, Excuse me, that twenties year, yeah. That we could go and achieve something. Um, I, th- I think if uh, if I remember correctly, we scored that last try and Pence had kicked the conversion. Yeah. And, uh, from the, was it from the touchline? Yeah, where he's come yeah, off the bench. I remember it. Yeah, I do remember. Just like last tap with this bloke on the face. Hard <laughs> like, luck, pal. I'm lucky, whatever. And the next thing, like the bloke started wrestling him, and then all I've seen is some guy, some French fella. With a bib on, absolutely come flying across and land his Swede on Pat Palmer. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is riots happening. And we lost, we lost a couple of boys then, bands because of that. Obviously, they lost. And the worst thing was we were sharing a hotel with them. So literally, they've all gone back to the hotel. <laughs> they've gone back to the hotel, and um, we're uh, we start. We've like been kept in the liberty for a couple of hours. Yeah. Afterwards, we literally get back to the to the hotel and marry it down a bay. They're all sitting in the foyer waiting for us. Oh, fuck yeah. They're all sitting there cross out like angry, big mean. So we had a little bit of a meeting and we were waiting for uh, one of the boys to come down, Jimmy Norris, and he's literally gone in the lift and Bastro's in the lift with him all the way down. And he's come out and he's like white as a sheet of paper. And he wasn't much colour to him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> big old and, unit, uh, like. They sent us home for the night end, but... Um, we went back the the, uh, the following day, and uh, to be fair, they they were all pretty decent about it. And then on the on the last night, um, we literally turned our floor into a actually mine and Pooey's room. We literally went to Tesco's across the road, got a load of stack of beers after the last game, <laughs> yeah. built a bathroom nice, and we had a good old beer and a, a sing song with the Frenchies. Then, and to be fair, a lot of them that year have gone on to make it themselves, um, oh. like. Um, the nine Morgan Para, Bastro, yeah. Dan David, uh, Maestri, the second row. So, a lot of those boys, to be fair, went on that year as well. Benjamin Fall um, have gone on to have pretty decent careers as well. Yeah, yeah. A fair, fair play. That is class. Like, it's, it's only when you look back, you realize, so, like, for me as a fan, I suppose, looking back, some of the names then, you're like, I was looking, I think when, when I did this with Chicken before, and you look at, he was playing 10 and Bowden Barrett's playing 15. You're like, fuck, fair play. Like, you forget about. <laughs> You forget about those things, don't you? Because yeah. at twenties, you don't remember the name so much. We had a we had a back three of Jason Tubby on one wing, Dan yeah. Evans on a uh, fullback, and Pence on the other wing. It's like you know, it was it was literally get the best fifteen players on the field at the time. <laughs> yeah, I see. Tubby's not a winger. <laughs> he won the winger, but he did a hell of a job. We were playing more foot three full backs, I think. <laughs> yeah, just roaming along that back line. Yeah, class. <laughs> but what no, was Oh, got it. Yeah, that is that is class. What's your what was your sort of memories of the Scarlets then, and your experience at the Scarlets? Because obviously being a Westie as well, there. Oh yeah, seven years. It's a good, decent old yeah, shift, isn't it? Uh, Ten years through the academy time as well. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I was pretty, pretty young puppet when I was coming through, and probably didn't know how to take the banter. <laughs> yeah, I just get wound up all the time. I was yeah. quite an aggressive blow. 
But to be fair, you know, there were some great characters in there, people like Vernon Cooper and uh, Yestin Thomas. Yeah. Small, some of the guys who'd probably experienced the amateur and which went into the prem, uh, into the professional era as well. Yeah. So, you know, these guys were probably coming to the end of their careers, but to spend like maybe four or five years with them and experience yeah. the good times with them, good socials, uh, old school socials. Um, and Vernon just pitch up at a bar and literally say, Meet me here at six o'clock on Saturday after a game. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, mate. Um, yeah. You just sit there for the rest of the night drinking Stella. Oh, mate. Think of you, uh, mate. I've still never got over the fact you drink Malibu milk, mate. Oh, I only drink it when I get heartburn on night out. Oh, I couldn't think. I've still never tried it, but. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 if you're struggling on a night out for heartburn, you've had too many uh, Red Bulls or whatever, get a nice Malibu milk. Settles the stomach, sorts you right out. Um, but no, there was some, like, obviously there's people like Matthew Reese and Stephen Jones. Yeah. Um, Simon Easterby, uh, Dav Jones, who's, who just lives down the road now in my house. Uh, obviously, I was coming through with people like Ken and Reese Priestman. Yeah, we had yeah. a real good group of us boys come through together then. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mark Jones, obviously another one, coaching Crusaders yeah. now. He was probably the worst. He'd wind, wind the shit that out of the young boys. And then, like, I remember one time, we, Ken Owens left with a bin bag full of rubbish in his, in his bag. And, like, if you wound them up so much, they'd, like, go and cut your boot laces and, or stick your boots to the, 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 like, the posts in the change rooms and stuff like that. And you'd be, like, scrambling out of the change rooms trying to get out on the pitch on time. They'd find the hell out of you for being late. If you, and, like, literally, you'd have to tape your boots off because you don't have any laces left. <laughs> I remember, I remember um, the uh, Gav Evans was I mean, Gav Evans the centre. Yeah, yeah. He had these brand new Timberland boots, <laughs> and he wore them to training once. And he left them, uh, and he was winding someone up on the, and they went and put them in the deep freezer. Oh, <laughs> ruined. Ruined them. Ruined so, all the speed on him. He was fuming about that. <laughs> oh, I love it though. That's the thing, though. That's the sort of camaraderie you need when you know it's a tough enough game as it is, and you know, like. You see on social media now all these people after a game, you know, if you're, say like you play against the Scarlets now and you see Foxy and you two just have a little laugh, but one of you's yeah. lost, Twitter then will go mad, like, why are they laughing? And I'm like, fucking ch- chill out, like, you're allowed to laugh at a bad day at the office. Sometimes the bigger picture is that your mates, and yeah. you know, as soon as you've, as soon as you've uh, you know, hit lumps out of each other and gone hammer and tong for 80 minutes, Sometimes you just want to sit down and have a beer and a laugh with each other. And, yeah. You know, or, but if you know the guy, or you don't either know, know the guy, um, you're, gonna, you're probably still going to sit down and have a beer with him because you know, there's a mutual respect there that yeah. they just smash lumps out of each other. Um, you know what? There's, 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 that, there's that respect that you know, you're doing the same job as I am and you know, we'll have a beer together and just have a, or a chat like. But... You know, I, I, I've been there. It's like, I've been, I've been asked, oh, do you still speak to the Scars boys? Yeah, I still speak to a load of Scars boys. You know, um, yeah. I, still, I still live down west. You know, it's still, say that, there's probably not many still at the Scarlets who were there when I was there. So, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it still means a lot to play against them but whenever because yeah. um, I'm originally from that, from that club. Yeah. yeah. Do you, um, do you ever, I just mentioned social media then. You, you, you're not quiet on it, but you know, you're not what you're not out there like some of the other guys are. Do you ever, you know, have you ever taken much shit on there after a bad game or you know that red card or whatever? And and if you do again, how do you deal with that in terms of? I do uh, um, Tend not to try and avoid the negative comments. There was a uh, there was a tag I was tagged in the other week talking about uh, bringing back a Wales A team, but. Uh, and, the, and it just spiralled out, out of control on Twitter. And I, I didn't yeah. say anything, but um, I was getting tagged in every re- reply. It was yeah, like, yeah. what? Knowing where we are with the COVID and the financial yeah. finances, where we are financially with the game, there's absolutely no way we can have an A-team. You know, yeah. it'd be nice to see one. It'd be nice to see these youngsters get, get the opportunity. Yeah. But financially... You know, you need to. You probably need to look beyond that tweet and think. Well, financially, can it? Is it? Is it actually uh, manageable? But I don't at the moment. I don't think it is. And you know, I, I, I don't want to get involved in that. I'm on there 
for the odd on on Instagram, Twitter, for the odd uh, post here and there. But I'm probably not as socially active as I could be. But you know, I think uh, you know I'm I do enough. It's probably a good thing to be honest, mate. I I had arguments with people the other week before you announced that you were playing at the Dragons, and someone tweeted going, "Why can't they play at Lambda Fields?" And I went, "You fucking what?" That Lambda Fields. So, like, do you understand anything about, like, Tier 1 teams and where they play? Oh, it might even be the Wales game. I can't remember, right? And then there's there's one particular gentleman. I'm not going to mention his name on purpose. Well, it could be played at Merthyr or Caffili or Sardis Road. And you're like, mate, it's going to cost 50 to 100 grand just to make the stadium compliant. Yeah. Is it, like, COVID compliant? Then security. And then... Like, I don't understand what goes through some of these people's fucking heads, like. It, it, it does it's baffle me sometimes, but it's wild. you just have a little chuckle to yourself and you just <laughs> yeah. ignore it, swipe up, keep going. Oh, I, I can't sometimes. I, I Someone trolled me yesterday, mate. Call me pathetic. Uh, and, I, I remember uh, one Wales game, uh, we'd lost to Argentina, and I, I'd done my MCL in the, like, the second minute, got stepped by Sanchez. He's, he's, he's still doing that now. So yeah, um, and uh, it was my was it first half Wales? I was my first half Wales as well. Yeah, Autumn Internationals 2012. Got stepped MCL, uh, strapped up by about 75 minutes. I'm literally hanging on. I, my knees are the size of a melon, and yeah, um, I've known I've done so. And it's just you know I just wanted to get through that game. Yeah, um, and it's literally had some serious abuse. It's like what a waste of time. And then uh, wouldn't play him again. Too fair, can't on play another thirteen times. <laughs> <laughs> it baffles so, me, like it does baffle me. Like I love, I I almost love it sometimes for like I don't know the double or you or the blues or someone just to go right. We're going to select like the fifteen worst tweets that we can find. Yeah, we're, and we're openly now on social media. We're going to invite you fifteen people to come down for a training session for the day. Uh, Half of them, half of them, though, hide behind that bloody... An egg. Yeah, an egg. Yeah, on Twitter, yeah. But I'd love it, like, just train... Even, even... Yeah, I mean, just even training at the academy. Like, you don't want to get, you know, roughed up by the first team, fair enough. But it just... Even non-contact training. Just go through a session and then tweet that they're fucking shit. Well, half, half the issue is they've probably never been involved in a pro environment, which is... Uh, and they probably... I haven't got a clue what they're talking about, which is no. no. If uh, it, it does baffle me, I think Dicko Dicko cops some abuse once for the Blues, and uh, just one of those games where it just like he played well one week, didn't play so well the second week, and so someone went really at him personally, and someone else, it might have been Timmy or someone, tagged me in it, and like at the time I was a bit more of a renegade, a bit of a cannon, and they were basically like go to town on this guy. Well, I, I just try to be a bit more kind now and a bit more uh, maybe sarcastic without being nasty. But back then, I was I just fucking let him have it, basically. And then next thing you know, I've got like 20 or 30 like old blokes, basically, firing in at me on Twitter, left, left, right, centre. So I was like, fuck this. Right, you... Right, come and meet me now if you want to go. And I proper got stuck into it. Like one of the boys did that. He'd uh, he'd been uh, called out on uh, like one of these forum sites, and yeah. he found out who it was. And I won't name the player, but he found out who it was. Went up to him in a pub and said, "Me and you outside now." I seen where he went. Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I didn't. He's like backing off straight. Yeah, shit houses, uh, mate. Absolute shit houses. Fucking winds me up. Thanks, are you? Yeah, I, I, I do appreciate that. Like, the thing is, that everyone wants you to be a role model. And at the same time, they feel they can just tear strips out of you as well. And it's yeah. kind of which one do you want them to be? Do you want them to be a scapegoat or the role model? You kind of can't let people cover you for everything. Talk about your Wales career then. So, because you, you're one of those guys, you've been in the squad fucking hundreds of times, but you're always competing against world class operators as well, especially in your position in the back row and then. Obviously, in the second row a little bit as well. Well, what, what's your ex, you know what's your experience and what's your your overall feeling about your Wales Wales career? Well, I, I got I got picked for the first squad 
my first squad was the Lions 2009 and they went to uh, South Africa and I went okay. off to that, that year to North America and Canada. Yeah. And like, again, um, it took five or six uncapped players and I, I, was, I was the only one to come back uncapped. And I, um, you know, it, it probably dented me a little bit because I felt like I probably, let's say now on the flip side of it, I probably wasn't ready for it either. Because yeah. when I did get it in 2011 in the Six Nations, I felt like they earned it because I was picked on merit. I was they picked a small squad of 28 players, and you know they left some they left some people like I think Martin Williams got left out of that year, and you know I was picked in front of him, and um, I you know I I've been in real good form from probably late 2010 yeah. leading into that year, and um, um, I just thought you know it's. You know, I earned it, and I earned that selection. And then, you know, to get that was my one and only Six Nations cap was that was that uh, game against Scotland. I was yeah. on the bench the following week, and then, funny enough, I've got three Grand Slam medals, but never played a game in any of the. <laughs> <laughs> That's class. Uh, I've been picking a few squads, and like, I, I kind of got this um, reputation for being like called up last minute. And just going out and doing a job. Like, yeah. I remember 2014, um, so yeah, 2012, we played the Bar Bars before they sent a group of boys out to Australia yeah. uh, early because they thought, right, we'll prep them, uh, prep them ready, get them out there, acclimatized, <laughs> left the rest of the boys, uh, bin juice, if you want to call them, behind, <laughs> play against the Bar Bars, and we carved them up. And then uh, we went out, we followed them out there, and uh, we were out there. We played, they played the first test, got smashed. They decided to stick with the same, uh, same team. They said, look, we'll give these boys an opportunity again to go for yeah. it. Midweek team played again, battered the Brumbies. Yeah. And they got yanked over the back of the bus going, midweek team's on fire. <laughs> first are getting battered. <laughs> Showing it down the bus so like literally the coaches could hear it. And then um, we... Uh, we uh, finished, they finished on the third test, literally kept the same team again, just lost. Um, and then um, I didn't play them for, I don't know, picking the third, 2013 Six Nations, didn't play them until 2014, probably possible. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, like, there was a few boys, and that was my last year at the Scarlet's, and I'd been in decent form actually. Yeah. Uh, and again, there was a few boys injured, Tipston was injured, Warby was injured, so... It was like literally who was going to play um, open side, and it was a bit of a straight shootout between me and Shane's then. And yeah. they obviously, they'd obviously picked their test team, and I played the midweek game against the Kings, had a pretty decent, decent game. And then yeah. uh, the, the starters got hammered in that first, in that first, uh, first test. Yeah. And, um, so, like literally, got a uh, got an opportunity in that second test, and we lost 31, 30 or 32, 31, something like that. Um, but you know, just incredibly proud, grateful to have that opportunity to put that jersey on and be involved in a test like that against South Africa. Yeah. And then, <laughs> funny enough, I, I've I've I got a little bit of blame for that test. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get picked then until like 2016, and uh, I was like two years in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, and then 2016 situation, run a form again. Don't think I played. <laughs> then. Um, Again, miss was in and out, uh, dipped in and out. Um, remember, played against England before we went to New Zealand. I think it was that 2016, maybe. So I was like, there, there, about the summer tours. Must be good. Yeah. Tour, so. good, swig. <laughs> yeah. good, old, good on tour. Good swigger. Yeah, good swigger. Um, then um, uh, last minute, someone got injured. I got called up to Argentina. Uh, was they played Washington, they played South Africa in Washington and then Argentina. Yeah. And I managed to get on the bench for the two, uh, well, uh, on the bench for the two Argentina tests. Like, I was literally going out there thinking I'm going to be holding pads just as cover. They like yeah. talking about literally going to give um, opportunities to all these young boys. And I think there was like two guys on the trip who'd, I think I was on that trip, there's only one player who'd been capped before me. And it was, that's, how, that's how mental it was. And, uh, you know, some of those young kids have gone on now and they've got like 20 caps ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, they were in a rich vein of form and I was, you know, 
I didn't think that I'd get any game time, but you know, it, it was a bit of icing on the cake. I'd booked a holiday to go away, uh, yeah. bags were packed literally. Uh, <laughs> had a phone call, and they said, um, uh, "Yeah, can you meet us in Heathrow tomorrow? Uh, we'll get someone to come pick you up um, tomorrow and um, come out to Argentina, out to America, and out, out to Argentina with us." I was like, "Yeah." Yeah. So I, uh, See you later. Put the bags out to uh, which La- to Lanzarote with her. So I literally flew from Buenos Aires to Heathrow. Got an uh, Uber from um, Heathrow down to uh, Gatwick. Flew from Gatwick to Lanzarote. Got there. I was literally like, hang on. And the the hotel wouldn't let me in then. Ah, oh, what? <laughs> so like, well, like, oh, you're not you you're not registered here. And I was like, what? I, uh, my wife and kids are down in the. On the block, yeah. you know, my passport and everything. They were like, <laughs> "That was a nice little surprise." They didn't know I was actually turning up, so uh, missed the first two days. But you know, I'll always be grateful for what you know. I, I know I'm coming. I'm probably they're looking at a lot more youngsters now in that Welsh environment. And yeah, what, what I have have achieved, and you know, my phone my phone's always on uh, on uh, loud if they want to give me a call. Pivac's te- texting you now, boy. <laughs> How do, how do you stay? Huh? We got someone with a hard edge and durability, then uh, I'm there, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm fucking not, let me tell you. <laughs> how do you stay motivated when you're kind of in and out of squads like that? Because it, it must be a bit demoralising to, that's your dream to play for Wales, and then some people might dream about, say, Lions or, or whatever. But how do you stay? You're obviously a good squad player in terms of get the boys going love a laugh, love a social side of it, but you fucking work really hard as well. So you're obviously yeah. good to be around in the squad. How do you stay at that level without dropping, knowing that there is a Warbs who's playing six at the moment and he's captain, or, you know, they're bringing in a Wainwrights or people like that, and you just think, oh, um, I can't see it. That's a, that's a tough question to ask, but, you know, I, I kind of just love what I do, basically. Like love my job, and you know, um, since I was a young kid, that uh, you know, uh, I remember people used to ask me, "What do you want to do when you're older?" And I said, "I wanted to be a rugby player." And, um, I used to say I wanted to be like Scott Brunel. So I just remember him playing against France in uh, one of the Six Nations games, rampaging down the touchline. I, I literally yeah. used to go. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Reenact that with my brothers outside in the garden, like trying <laughs> to sleep over. But <laughs> um, you know. It, that's it's what I wanted to do, and you know, I, I think you know, as as long as I'm happy doing it, I'll try and do it for as long as possible. And uh, yeah, you know, especially with these youngsters starting to come through now, they're making me feel young again. So yeah, uh, yeah. most of them are in their mid twenties. I think there's there's boys who are making their if they're like twenty years old now, you know, I remember Debbie fifteen years ago. These boys <laughs> are like years old. Yeah, you know, that's it, class. It, like, um, you know, it's it. And that's where, like, I think Dylan came up with the granddad comment. Even though it's like <laughs> Billy, who was older than me in the squad, but yeah, and he yeah. and his and his lid's still in a bit as well. Oh, thin it! He wants to get it redone. <laughs> he wants some money back for that. <laughs> in Manchester Studio. Oh, but no, I, I just kind of like I said to you earlier, it's those like some little small um, targets I set myself. Like, look, I want to be top tackler, you know, um, or top carrier, you know, those little things, you know, you, like you always want to keep improving your game. The game is yeah. constantly evolving. And I've always tried to say, like, I want to keep moving with the game. And um, at the end of the day, it's a simple game. You catch, pass, tackle, clean yeah. rocks, you know, whatever terminology the coaches use, you know, it may be a little bit different to what the last coach used, but at the, at the end of the day, the game will be the same. Yeah. As long as you do what you're good at, and you keep working on what you're not so good at. Um, yeah. I just enjoy it. Not too complicated, mate. I like your attitude. Quite simple and basic, but uh, effective. What's, um, what, why the switch then from Scarlets to Blues? What was, how did that come about? Um, I'd been there, I'd been there obviously seven years. Um, and I kind of, I was toyed between like six, seven, eight. And it was like, I wasn't in a set position. But I was a first choice back rower. Yeah. So it was kind of like the makeup of the back row would depend on who's available. So like if we had a Johnny Eds, if say Rob McCluskey and Shings weren't available, then 
you know, if Rob wasn't available, I'd play eight and Shins would play six. And then we'd have Johnny Edge at seven or Richie Pugh at seven. And then, you know, if, if uh, myself, Shins and Rob were all available, then I'd probably be the one to play seven because I was more suited to that role at yeah. ten. Um, probably lost a yard of pace. So I wouldn't consider doing it now. But, <laughs> um, the game's changed a little bit where, like, you know, obviously around then, everyone was kind of copying what Slavka were doing. Slavka was just big men. Yeah. Really in the contact area. And just steamrolling everyone. So, yeah. you know, my face probably fitted the best of that seven, where I probably knew I was probably a better six stroke eight than I was a seven. Yeah. And I just kind of wanted that, wanted that position. Um, and when I'd signed for the Scarlet, I signed my first senior contract. Within like uh, three, four months, Phil Davis left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to play underneath him. And then, funny enough, he actually rocked up the Blues. He was coaching the Blues then. And, uh, I spoke to the Blues two years earlier and hadn't, I'd stayed with the Scarlets. And then yeah. they, they got in contact with my agent again and said, look, what's, you know, he's out of contract soon. What's his thoughts? And I actually went to meet Phil again and he was coach of the Blues. <laughs> sat yeah. down with him had a conversation and literally they said, look, we're looking for a six to uh, And kind of my ears pricked up a little bit and I was like, you know what? You know, I, could, I could do it. You know, um, yeah. It's only 45 minutes to, from the house to the Vale. You know, it's not too bad. And... Uh, I remember when they said, oh, the contract was sent to your agent. I, I'd uh, literally moted it up the M4, signed it. <laughs> and was like, <laughs> oh, God, that's done. Because I was like, starting to get questions. Like, are you staying? Are you going? What's happening? And, yeah. Uh, what's the line? And, you know, I've been there an equal amount of time now, if not yeah. more. So, um, once that, once he said, look, you know, we look for that six. And the first couple of years, I pretty much played all my rugby at six. And then, yeah. obviously, you know, teams were starting to play like a back rower in the second row and utilising that a little bit, you know, obviously um, getting the extra, um, what do they say, um, the more rangy athletes on the field. Then. Yeah. Um, and it kind of suited suited the Blues um, because of the artificial turf and the way the game was playing when we had Danny and, and Matt Schrapp coaching us there. You know, it worked well. Yeah. Um, but again, like I've played four, five, six, seven, and eight since I've been in the Blues. So <laughs> yeah. You know, that utility tag now, and I, you know, I, I'm, I won't, won't shy away from it either because at the end of the day, um, I'm happy when I'm on the field, and yeah. you know, regardless of what numbers on my back, the job pretty much stays the same. So you know, I think sometimes you can overcomplicate things by thinking too much about playing in. Oh, I've got the seven on my back rather than the four or whatever, and you yeah, start. Yeah. The, the game and um, it's it's not like that. Just do your job and do what you're good at. At the end of the day, you'll listen to what you're doing. Then, when everyone's fit, you've got a few back rows like that. Obviously, Navidi can play right across. Ellis has played right yeah. across. So you guys can just play a bit more, I suppose, of a fluid game. And Blues have had success, some success over the last few years as well. Obviously, you know, you look at Bill Bow and and that weekend, and that was obviously unbelievable. Well, but, that was, um, that was probably. Up there with one of the best moments of my rugby career. I actually, I, I've said this a few times now. I actually enjoyed the semi-final game against Pau more than I did yeah. the final. Yeah, but probably because there was like uh, no one was expecting us to do anything against a star-studded Pau team. From yeah, the over and, uh, turn them over at the uh, Full Arms Park. Yeah, and that night afterwards was bouncing as well. To be fair, you know, I missed it. I was a, I was a, in Barcelona on a stag, but we had a box. I was devastated. I missed uh, it. And uh, and then. You know, the following week we played the Ospreys and uh, Danny decides to make like 13 changes. He's like, oh, chicken, JT, word. It's like, you two are rocking up again this weekend. It's like, ah. <laughs> like, we're we're he's like, literally changed everyone else. And to be fair, he's like, oh, no, listen, mate, you can have a run in the back row as well. Because, you know, I've pretty much been playing second row most that year. Yeah. Right, and we literally just lost the Ospreys by like a point or something. It was nicked in the last, last play of the game or whatever. And then we uh, we were bounced into Bilbao week. It was literally like I remember how cool it was. Was when you got Blaine Scully walking down from the hotel down to the stadium. He's got his shades on. It's just like headphones on, shades on, just cool yeah. and it was like it just felt right. And you know, yeah. um, we we got out there. We spent the whole weekend out there. Obviously, yourself in an arm brace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking um, disgrace. Uh, Absolutely disgrace. Some on the Sunday watching Leicester. Leinster, rip, uh, Leinster, sorry, rip up. And then, you know, I remember coming back and I, I was sharing a room with Navs. And yeah. obviously, he down. he'd done his uh, 
he'd done his uh, shoulder. And we, we yeah. got back to the and, uh, we both got our medals around our necks and he's like, I said, look, I'll drop you back. I need to go back that way anyway. Dropped him back in the house. He's like, mate, do you want to come out tonight? We're going to have a few beers down, uh, down Park Hanna. Do you want to come down? It's like, because you can stay, you can stay. I've got, I've got room sorted and everything. Like, I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. Wait, and like, so. Ask your missus. I dropped him off. I dropped him off. And I was literally driving out with drive. And I, I rang the missus. And I was like, oh, where are you? And she goes, oh, we're still in, we're still in uh, Bordeaux, wherever they've flown from. Because they literally yeah. flown from Bordeaux and driven down. Yeah. And then we went back till the early morning. She was like, oh, go and enjoy with the boys. So like, yeah. go on then. Um, literally got out food, beers, We've gone over to, uh, I think it might be beer one, and I see just now sitting in this inflatable on the floor. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is he doing? Oh, mate. <laughs> oh, it was an absolute epic weekend. I think not much will live up to that. You know, I no, came back it was unbelievable. I think uh, follow, was it, sometime that week, I'd had a week off and friends, we just all got together and had a mental session, one of the friends' uh, gardens. Yeah, I remember. I remember you uh, wore that Instagram. Me day three is better than day two, or something like that. Day two, day four is better than day three, or something. It was something like that. But I'd gone full, like literally four or five days on the smash. One time ruined afterwards, but you know. Yeah. Aye, yeah. definitely. What is it about the blues? Because everyone will speak. Obviously, I'm down there quite a bit with work or whatever. Everyone will speak to you behind the scenes. Loves it down there, like the players, and I know you said that you've had a couple of honesty sessions over the last couple of games, but on the whole, everyone's normally got good things to say about it. What is it about that culture down there? And the boys look like they play for each other. I think it's because obviously, I think you look at the last last couple of weeks. There's a lot more. There's something like um, there's a ridiculous number the other week of how many. Academy Blues members were actually in the start of 15 or in the, yeah. in the 23. And to be fair, I think because all those boys are coming through together now, um, and are pretty much the, the, the Cardiff boys, uh, or you know, they've been involved in, in the Cardiff region for since they were young, yeah. growing up together, and you know, that creates a bond, then doesn't it? So, you know, you're gonna have each other's back basically, and you know, I think. Everyone gets on with each other. There's always a little bit of banter between the boys, but yeah. you know, um, it's it's really good there. And I guess because a lot of them are under 25, yeah. you know, um, they you know they're all of the same age, and you know they all just want to play for each other, basically. Yeah, I feel I like it, mate. It's good. What's the future for you then, pal? Well, you know, 32, 28, 28. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, the rest. Uh, I have to do, yeah. Um, oh, look, I've I've been doing some coaching the last. Um, well, actually, I've been coaching about eight years. Um, yeah. Started when I was at Scarlet, so I was doing the Scarlet Academy and age grade teams, 18s. Um, did a little bit of the Blues 18s. Uh, then did my local club the last two years. Yeah. Um, just trying to get different experiences, really. And then this year, I'm going to be doing Commander Quinns. Yeah. Nice. Just go and it's something that I want to get into after rugby. You know, I, I quite enjoy it. Um, obviously, because I, you know, I'm quite detailed in what everything I do anyway in, in yeah. terms of rugby. I guess I probably had some of my biggest learnings from coaching in terms of yeah. the, the transition to playing. Because when you've got a coach trying to explain something to you and you rep it, but then you actually go and try and coach what he's trying to coach you, you get a better understanding of it. Yeah, okay. That's some of my biggest learnings. Yeah. Um, and you're always trying to pick up little things from all the coaches you, you work with. You know, you might not even like some of the coaches you work with. You yeah. might like their traits or what they do, or you might have different sort of opinions and whatnot. But, you know, there might be that one thing you think, you know what, he actually does that pretty well. You know what, I might pinch that off him. It could be yeah. how he talks in a meeting or how, and how he presents things. Or, you know, um, you're always trying to pick up little things. Um, and, you know, I've tried to do that over the last couple of years. And I've got, like, things I've written down in books uh, notebooks that you know just oh you've done that so well and that's so like when you've got when you've got it then you can reference back to it then or you yeah. might think of it again and, you know i worked with some quality quality coaches over the last you know my fi- over 15 years i've been playing so yeah, yeah. you know try to pick up something little off everyone 
uh, you know, hopefully it put me in a decent place when I want to transition into coaching. Shouldn't be too bad. How, how are you as a captain? What sort of, when, you, when you've got the captaincy now and again, what, are you, what sort of captain are you? Vocal and shouty or just lead from the front uh, and follow uh, me? Yeah, I think there's, there's times when it's, look, follow me. Um, I'll just go and lead by example. And like, I think the good thing around the Blues is now that there's been quite a few boys who've been captain. So yeah. obviously we've had like, um, Daisy's been captain. Navs has been captain. I've been captain. Um, Corey Hill's been captain. Um, yeah. You know, you've got you've got leaders in and around that environment, and yeah. um, the more players you can have who are leaders, the less work that captain actually has to do sometimes. And like, yeah. the captain might be the one who goes and speaks to the ref, but then you've got someone who's responsible for defence and attack. And like, your halfbacks are, are quite vocal. And obviously, you're Jared. Yeah. Um, Jared and Thomas and Lloyd. Lloyd's obviously captain of the Blues as well. So, you know, less work, less pressure you have to put on them, the better. And like, yeah. you know, it's sometimes it's about having a good rapport with the referees as well and you know when to go and speak to them. But sometimes you can have boys who are just going absolutely nuts. Go and speak to them about that. Go and speak to them about that. And it's like, look, I'll find my shots when I'm ready. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I like to try and motivate the boys in the change room. Like, who's going to put the fucking first shot in? Who's going to fucking steam all over the top of somebody? Yeah. Who's going to, who's going to, who, like, next job. If, if anything negative happens, it's the f- next job. Positive, yeah. always positive. Taps on backsides. Win the small collisions. Win the small battles. Celebrate the small wins. Make sure we all get in tight. And, you know, just those little mindset, those little triggers. And then the rest of it, I guess, you know, it's going back to what we talked about. It's just a simple game. Where you yeah, yeah. Run, run at people, pass the ball, whack people when defence and, you know, try and put those big shots in, you know, and the rest of it, you know, obviously you scrum and line up. You, you, you're pushing the line up, jumping the scrum, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, mate, that's inspiring. I'd play for you, pal. If that's what you like, I'd definitely, uh, I'd definitely have a round yeah. for you, mate. A little bit different as a coach, though. When I try and speak to the boys, it's like you're trying to yeah, get I- Getting your technical advice across, you're not just like trying to ramp them up. Are you analytical, are you? What then? Analytical. Uh, I can be when I want to be, especially when I'm doing the like coaching and stuff. But like I remember doing the doing the uh, Scarlet's 18s, I was like new to coaching and I was literally grabbing the boy saying, What the fuck are you doing? That's shit. Make sure you chop his fucking legs. Like, I was going nuts. The, the head coach pulled me to say, He goes, you can't speak to kids like that. They're like 16, 17 years old. It's like, cool it down a little bit. <laughs> and button him like, come on. That's just, that's just how passionate I was about it. I probably watched yeah. too, many, uh, too many uh YouTube clips or whatever. <laughs> People going out three months. But I love it. Um, you know, Gilly's quite vocal in there. He loves to wrap the boys up. He's like, fucking get in their face to fucking smash them. And you know, I breathe off that. I start jumping up down, like, yes, get the limp biscuit on, wrap the music up. Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, sometimes some of the boys don't like that. They put a towel over there and just put their headphones on because they want to be yeah. in their own zone. Like, That's what I would be like. They don't want they to... Don't and you've got, to, you've got to appreciate everyone's different, how they get themselves up for a game. Yeah. You know, it might be that first touch they have has got to be positive. Yeah. The yeah. first thing they do has got to be positive. And it's like, you start... I think as you get older, you get to start to understand how players work as well. Yeah, yeah. And you appreciate them for being different as well. Yeah, they bring all different qualities. I, I think I was one of those head down, couldn't be arsed with the team huddle and stuff until like the very end. I'd be watching Quade Cooper or Sonny Bill clips like, oh, do you reckon I can get this done today? <laughs> I, I, remember, I, I, I used to, uh, this is when I was first coming through, I used to be really like sit in the corner, headphones on, all to myself, literally never spoke a word to anyone. Yeah. Like, get up the last time, and one, two, three, uh, squeeze, out you go. Yeah. Literally, I got, I got told this by a coach called uh, John uh, Muggleton. He was at the Scarlet's for a good few years. And he said, hey, you're isolating yourself from your ho- the whole team when you, do, when you do that. So you're not getting those little conversations about what's going to be happening in the game. Um, and like those, those little conversations, like you don't realise then, but as you grow older, they become massive as part of the game. And yeah. Like, um, what's happening in the game, who's doing what, and it's just those little small conversations you're having. And, like, you can have music on in the background, but, like, yeah, kind of kind of that, that kind of, I try, kind of change my ways a little bit after that. You know, I was yeah. taking everything under the sun, like, uh, literally going on a phase one, Red Bull, 
<laughs> smash everything down me, pro class. Yeah. Feed you for a game, literally two minutes before going out, all in there is going to spill all back out. <laughs> it felt like 20 minutes in the game, I'm like, oh, fuck, I haven't got my second win yet. I can't get oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All nervous energy gone as well, burnt me out. And literally, <laughs> yeah. now it's just like, right, you kind of find a routine that works for you. And yeah, you know, I, I think as you get older as well, you kind of, you're the ones going to speak to the younger boys and have those little conversations and you're being yeah. positive and proactive about it. Because that's what yeah. they want. They want confidence knowing that you're going to be there. So you've got, um, you've got their arse covered, basically. Yeah, of course. Fucking look after them if they get picked on. Aye, aye. That's what you want to do, mate, Taylor. Fly in. <laughs> Class. Uh, Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you for coming on, pal. No worries, mate. It's been, been, a en- been enjoyable. Good uh, good couple of stories there. I've enjoyed that. Oh, you got to, got to get them out there, haven't you? Yeah, no, I, that's, what I, you know, that's what it's about. Obviously, I hope it, hopefully you've got a good few years left in you as well. We can... Uh, Carry on watching you at the Blues and, you know, who knows, hopefully a couple of extra Wales caps if they come your way as well. Chuck a few of the younger kids about and show them who's the granddad, is that right? The granddad. The, the granddad. <laughs> hey, mate, I appreciate the it. The granddad, that's sticking, pal. I'm going to tag you in that on Instagram. <laughs> uh, Trademark it. Yeah. Uh, nah, cheers, pal. Thanks to uh, Tiny Rebel Brewery. They give us a beers every episode. So uh, just have a nice Cali Pale Ale. Big thanks to everyone that downloads, 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 subscribes, rates and reviews. Catch us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at Catflap Chats. Biggest thanks to Mr. Josh Turnbull. Best of luck with everything, mate. Stay safe. Hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, we can have a beer after a game at the Arms Park. The Malibu milk to chase that. Mal- Malibu milk in betweenies. <laughs> I'm all awesome. over it mate take care Josh cheers bye yeah. ciao bye